it's uh, 9 a.m. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming and uh, spending a day with us today. We want this day to be uh, productive and hopeful and helpful to all of you. We have a day lined up with a lot of speakers. Most of them are my colleagues here at Stanford. By the way, my name is Sandy Srinivas. I'm a GU medical oncologist. I've been here at Stanford for about uh, 22 years now, and I specialize in uh, urologic oncology. So we see patients with kidney, bladder, and uh, prostate cancer. And I'm going to have my colleagues here at Stanford talk about various aspects of providing providing care for patients with kidney cancer. We've been doing this meeting now for almost um, 12 years, and it's all done through the uh, Kidney Cancer Association. So we happen to just partner with them to be able to do this for patients in the Bay Area. It used to be up at uh, uh, San Francisco in Japantown, and I think in the last three years, we decided that Stanford might be an easier place for people to come to than drive to the city. So we host this every year, and really the goal of this is to uh, provide education, show you where we are with this disease and what's new and what's upcoming. But I think really the purpose is also for you to feel comfortable, there's really no question which is stupid. This is a day just for you to get your thoughts and your questions answered, and really to share your stories with, amongst yourself, with us, and it's really that's what this day is for. In the past, people have felt a lot of comfort just coming into this meeting, learning about what what is available and what's <clears throat> new and upcoming in kidney cancer. So that's what we are going to do. I'm going to start off by just uh, doing a little bit by way of introduction, but that's just uh, the beginning, and we'll talk a lot more about each aspects of kidney cancer, the surgical aspects, the medical aspects, and I'm going to talk a lot about uh, genomics and personalized medicine. So I would just encourage each of you, don't hold back. You know, really, this is about how we can help clarify questions, concerns, anxiety, fears. There's really nothing that's off the table for today. So let me start by just giving you a very brief introduction. So I'll first start off with a picture of the kidney. So people think that every tumor that arises in the kidney is kidney cancer, but I'll just show you that when we talk about kidney cancer, it's really those that arise in the cortex. So the outer circle is what kidney cancer really is. And within kidney cancer, there are various subtypes, and we'll talk about that as well. But there are a lot of other cancers that can happen. Like, for instance, in the center, that's where urine is made. And you, the type of cancer that you can get from that is called urothelial cancer. So anything that starts in the center of the kidney, that's where urine is made. It goes through the urinary tubes called the ureter and then into the bladder. So we see um, urothelial cancers or bladder type of cancers happen in the center of the kidney. Then there are other cancers like lymphoma. So Stanford is a very big institution that's world renowned for uh, lymphoma, which can really happen in lymph nodes. But because we are a referral center, we see a lot of patients who have tumor in their kidney that ends up being a lymphoma. So the point of this slide is really to tell you that not all tumors that start in the kidney are necessarily kidney cancer. So especially for people coming from the outside, it's really important we look at the, um, the location of where the tumor started to give us some idea as to whether it's really a tumor that originated from the cortex or the outer lining of the kidney is what kidney cancer is. And that's what we are going to be talking about the whole day today. Stop me at any time, okay? Really, I think that's the best way we are going to get comfortable going through these slides. So how big a problem is this? So kidney cancer is... Uh, 
uh, not a common cancer, but common enough to make it to the top 10 cancers in both men and women. You can see compared to common cancers like prostate cancer and breast cancer, which affects close to 250,000 people a year, kidney cancer accounts for about 5% of the cancers in men and about 3% uh, in women. So it's around 27 to about 48,000 per year. And certainly, unfortunately, there are patients who it still accounts for the top 10 death that can happen from this disease. So clearly, we have a lot of work cut out for us in terms of what we want to accomplish with this disease. For the, most med for the majority of patients, kidney cancer is still diagnosed <coughs> at an early stage. So this slide shows you that 45% of patients who are diagnosed are diagnosed with localized disease. <coughs> meaning that their, ca their cancer is contained in the kidney and uh, will undergo a surgical removal. Another 25% we call as locally advanced. I'll show you the staging of kidney cancer in a minute. But that just means that the tumor has gone from the kidney and is invading either the blood vessels, the, kidney, the renal vein, or the inferior vena cava surrounding the ki uh, kidney. And that's about 25% of patients. Again, for these two groups, surgery is the first treatment that you would do and is still associated with a good cure rate. 30% of patients at diagnosis, unfortunately, have disease that may have left the kidney. And it really comes down to the anatomic location of where the kidney is. So it's located in a place where if you don't have blood in your urine, this is a disease that you're not going to pick up very frequently. So if you have blood, that's certainly something that you're not going to ignore. So people seek medical attention. But most of the time, it's like a pregnant uterus. You can have, you can have a, um, be pregnant and that not be shown for up to six months in people. So kidney is located in a location in our body that really doesn't show for a long period of time. So these 30% of patients were their first diagnosis is usually by either a spot in their lung. They go to the emergency room for something totally different, and they find a large mass in the kidney. So a third of patients even today present with metastatic disease. We can talk a little bit about screening that's being done in other cancers and why screening is really not offered in kidney cancer. Because it's not a, you know, you have to have from a, from a health perspective, from a health care for economic perspective, it's not a large enough percent for us to use like mammography for breast cancer. So there's really not a great tool that you have for screening and CT scans are associated with a certain level of radiation. So there's a lot of concern about just offering screening for every patient, which is a shame because Clearly, cancers that are detected early can be cured, but I think we have to get to a point where there is a better tool to screen for kidney cancer. So screening is really not standard today for, for every patient to just look to see if we can pick up these tumors early. In fact, uh, I don't know if Dr. Chung will talk about it, but there are a large number of patients who, uh, whose cancers are found incidentally. So they come for abdominal pain, maybe for a gallstone, and as they get a CT scan in the emergency room, a small tumor is detected in the kidney. For those patients, we actually just watch some of them because those tumors are very, very slow growing, and it takes many years before these tumors can really be detected. Yeah. Yeah, I think we are going to talk a little bit about the genomics. So there is an hereditary condition called VHL. So if for patients who are diagnosed with kidney cancer less than age 40, uh, 
So that's not a normal age for kidney cancer. The, sta the average age is in the 60s. So if you have, if you're diagnosed at the age 40, there is something that's predisposed you to develop this cancer. So the National Cancer Institute now recommends that patients who are diagnosed less than age 40 have a genetic test to see if there's something that's predisposing you to develop this. So if that's the case, then perhaps your children or the kids would have to be screened at an earlier age. So there is this syndrome called von hippel lindau syndrome, where it's not just kidney cancer, but there are other cancers that people are vulnerable to, such as brain tumors. So as we have a genetics clinic up here that we send patients to, and they do a screening, and they also come up with a recommendation about what would be good for us to screen for. You know, Are you at risk for getting colon tumors, other tumors? But I think that's where we are headed in terms of as we acquire more knowledge. Yeah. Slides? The presentation? Well, you know, this is, uh, this is being recorded, so it will be in the Kidney Cancer Association website. I'll ask them if they will have um, a copy of our presentation available to all of you who are here today. Yes. Has there been any advancement in terms of when you say diagnose? That doesn't mean that you really are going to understand if somebody is detected. Is there any way of testing back in terms of looking at the uh, cells to know kind of roughly when it actually began? So if the 40 year cutoff is when you, you, you might have been diagnosed at 50 or 55, but that might have been growing or started when you were 30 or 35. Yeah, people have, we haven't gotten that far, but we know a little bit about the growth pattern. So people know how long it takes for the kidney tumor to grow each year. And it's relatively slow growing, but unfortunately, you know, as you learn today, kidney cancer is so heterogeneous, meaning that um, there are so many different patterns that what we think, I mean, and we are unable to lump them all together in one bucket. So there are patients where the tumor growth is extremely slow, and on the other hand, there are some very rapidly growing tumors, and they are all not the same. So we are lumping them all today as kidney cancer, but I think as our knowledge increases, we are going to be putting them into different pies that we'll probably learn a little bit different. So to, you, to answer your question, I think we know a little bit about the growth pattern, and that's why patients' tumors, which are extremely small, are actually just watched because we know that tumors that are less than three centimeters, their um, risk of leaving the kidney and causing metastasis is very low. So it's not uncommon today that if you were to have multiple medical problems and you have a small tumor that's detected, uh, we would just watch you with a scan every six months because we know that the growth pattern is really slow growing, that it's very safe for us to watch you. And that tumor is, may not cause a problem in your lifetime if you have other medical problems that are more pressing. Okay, so here is the um, staging guidelines. You know, so all patients need to know this. When you have a diagnosis of kidney can or any cancer, the first thing we do is what's the extent of the cancer. So the American Cancer Society, there is a big staging system called AJCC. This is a common language that all cancer doctors across the country and across the world speak the same language so that we know what the staging system is. And that's what we do for kidney cancer. So it's stage one is if it's confined to the kidney. And it takes into account uh, something called TNM. And what it really stands for is the T stands for the tumor. And that's really what's, conf what's the size within the kidney. And then the N stands for lymph nodes. So nodal metastasis is what N stands for. And M is for metastasis. So you'll always have to know what is the TNM stage. 
And then after you get that, they sort of lump you into stage one, two, three, and four. So stage one are small tumors that are less than seven centimeters. And in fact, today we break it down even more into T1A and T1B, where tumors that are less than four centimeters are considered T1A, and four to seven would be T1B. T2 tumors or stage two is when you have a tumor that's between seven and 10 centimeters is T2A, and T2B is those that are greater than 10 centimeters, but you still have no evidence of spread to the uh, vena cava or to the lymph nodes, or there's no widespread mets, and those are considered stage two. Stage three, you're now beginning to see involvement of the blood vessels. So if there is, in, uh, you see the tumor that's big and it's gone into the renal vein or into the vena cava, which is a big blood vessel channel that brings blood from the lower part of your body to your heart, that would be considered stage three. And stage four is if there is any spread to lymph nodes outside the kidney area, if they're spread to lung, liver, bone, and brain, are all lumped as stage four disease. So knowing where you are in this is extremely important, and I would certainly urge you to um, check for your individual one. So. Once we have kidney cancer, we want to then know what is the histologic subtype. So as we are beginning to understand, I would say even in 2017, I think we are pretty crude about our knowledge and what we know compared to cancers like lung cancer, where they know they can separate a patient with lung cancer into so many different molecular subtypes. I think in kidney cancer, we are still working our way towards figuring that out. But right now, it's somewhat classified based on what the pathologist looks under the microscope. So the most common cell type is the first one, which is called clear cell kidney cancer. That's what happens in all almost 75% of patients have this subtype called clear cell kidney cancer. The other uh, cell type is called papillary. So there's papillary type one and there's papillary type two. And then there are less common subtypes like chromophobe and oncocytoma. So it's helpful to know this because A, you know, the uh, outcomes are very different. Today, our treatments, we, we treat them all the same, especially um, with medical therapy. We treat them the same today, but I think that's changing. Probably in the next three years, there'll be different treatments that we would do for papillary type 1 versus papillary type 2 versus clear cell. And then the surgical treatment is also a little bit different, where they would be more inclined perhaps to watch an oncocytoma compared to a surgical removal. I would still say there's a lot of work left in figuring out exactly these subtypes, but I think this is the uh, beginning. So just very briefly on background, because I know you're going, we are going to spend a whole talk dedicated to treatments, medical treatment, surgical treatment. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background so that you know what to look for for the rest of the day. So again, majority are clear cell, 75% are clear cell kidney cancer. Um, in the past, you know, uh, maybe in the 10 years prior to today, we had very little that we could offer patients with kidney cancer. And there used to be a drug called interferon, which we don't even use today. That's what we had for patients with kidney cancer. And I think the last 10 years, there's been a remarkable improvement with almost 10 to 11 drugs that we have today that we can treat patients with kidney cancer. And each of these have been associated with longevity. But I think the search continues because till we really end up curing kidney cancer, I think we can stop. But there's definitely been a lot of improvement and we are grateful both as providers and for our patients for the ability that we have to cause a prolongation of life. Today, I think you know we use these targeted drugs 
But clearly, the next step and the advancement in this field has really been the emergence of immunotherapy. You're going to hear a lot about that today. And it's really what these drugs help f allow your own body to fight the cancer. There's been great progress made in diseases like um, leukemias, where they are able to take your immune cells out of your body, completely re-engineer it, and send it back into your body to fight these cancer cells. And leukemias, which were completely fatal, even up to two years ago, now the cure rate is close to 80%. So I think it's remarkable, and I think that's where the hope is that there will be similar things. In, because all of us have an immune system. There's really no reason why that immune system can be put to work for each of us. So really, the hope rests on immunotherapy. While we are very grateful for the drugs that we have today, which have resulted in prolongation of life, I think the hope is to have something that will allow for a cure. And I think immunotherapy holds a lot of promise. And we learn from other uh, hematologic cancers are much less complex compared to solid tumors because there it's really one abnormality that they have. Here we need to get down to the understanding of the disease where it's not just one pathway. There are so many things that result in causing the cancer. So really re-engineering that is somewhat of a challenge, but the good news is that there's work being done. So here is the progress that's been made in RCC. So starting in 1992 was when we had a first drug called interleukin-2, or I listed there as high-dose IL-2. Uh, it's really an immunotherapy. It's a drug that's challenging to give. Patients end up being in the intensive care unit. They are really sick, and we have a 5% chance of a cure when we give this drug. And it's really a drug that's not applicable to a lot of people because, as I said in the beginning, this is a disease that happened in the 60s and 70s. And giving patients these sort of drugs, you need normal uh, kidney function, you need normal heart function, you need normal uh, liver function. All of your systems have to be pristine for us to be able to give you this drug. So it's really not applicable to a lot of patients. And then starting 2005, the understanding of the biology of kidney cancer has just led to a whole host of new drugs that you can see starting in 2005, we had serafinib. 2006, a drug called sunitinib got approved. 2007, we had a new class of drugs called mTOR inhibitors. Temsirolimus is an intravenous um, mTOR inhibitor in 2008. We had a drug called Bevacizumab, which was approved. 2009, there was another oral mTOR inhibitor called Everolimus. 2010, we had a drug called Pazopinib that was approved. 2012, Axitinib, which is another oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And in 2015, we had the first immunotherapy drug called Nivolumab approved. 2016 was um, another year where we had two additional drugs, one called cabozantinib and another drug called lenvatinib. So this is amazing progress to have in 10 years, really to have 10 different drugs. And I think this list will continue. You know, the next wave of trials is really looking at combination of drugs. And you're going to hear more about those as the day goes by. So this is how kidney cancer looks like in 2017, the drug therapy. We have immunotherapy with interleukin-2, interferon, an old drug which we don't use anymore, and nivolumab is our uh, choice for immunotherapy that we have today. There are these whole class of VEGF inhibitors, sunitinib, sorafenib, pazopinib, axitinib, bevacizumab, cabozantinib, and lenvatinib plus everolimus, and then this class of drugs called mTOR inhibitors. So it's really, this is a complex slide. Um, we'll probably go into a little bit more detail in one of our talks, but uh, you can see that this is how kidney cancer, understanding the biology of kidney cancer has just led to this explosion of many drugs, and we hope that list continues. So we have a lot of uh, things that we, we want to know, but our goal for you today is to share some of these questions. 
So what's the appropriate surgical management? Is there a role of kidney removal in patients whose disease had spread elsewhere? And we're gonna have Dr. Chung talk to you today about that. What happens, everybody is curious, you know, we have two kidneys, but everybody, most people are going to have that kidney removed. What happens to kidney function after you lose one kidney, and how important is that going to be? Dr. Leppert is one of our urologic surgeons. He's going to talk a little bit about that. One of my uh, junior colleagues up here, Dr. Sumit Shah, he's going to talk a little bit about immunotherapy and what that promise holds and what is um, what are we doing at Stanford that you may have access access to. And then I have one of my uh, star uh, fellows, Brian Dietrich. He's going to talk about how do we pick between these 10 drugs? What is appropriate for us to give you for first line? What do we do when one treatment fails? How do we pick the next line of therapy? And then Alice Fan, who many of you may know, is a colleague of uh, mine in medical oncology. Her lab and her research is going to be, how can we tell when these drugs are working? She's going to share some of her work and help us understand those questions. Um, a lot of it is about genomics. You know, it's all the new era is about personalized medicine. So to help us understand this language. Alex Elishin, who's one of our senior fellows, he's going to talk a little bit about uh, genomics and how that is, pertains to kidney cancer. I'll come back and briefly talk about patients who have their kidney removed. Is there any role of preventive therapy? So we do this in breast cancer. We do this in colon cancer. What's new in kidney cancer? How can we not even deal with this disease, and is there any role of giving treatment in a preventive fashion? And finally, I have a social worker, Jordan, talk to us a little bit for a patient forum. This is your day today, so we want you to be engaged, and Jordan is going to help us have a conversation with all of us. So I think I'll stop there. There'll be a lot of room for questions during the day, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of what's coming. So if you're good, I think I spent 30 minutes. So I'm gonna have Dr. Chung. Uh, so Ben Chung is a urologic surgeon. So he's one of our surgeons. He's the director of the laparoscopic kidney program here at Stanford, the robotic program. Dr. Chung is an associate professor of urology. He's been here at Stanford, Ben, for 10 years? 11 and counting, so. It's our pleasure to have Dr. Chung here today. We thank him for spending his morning with us on a Saturday. And I would urge all of you to ask any question of surgical uh, that you have. Feel free, again, you know, don't hesitate. The day would be a success if each of you are engaged and have questions that you can have clarified.